A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Lusa. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide. Gabriel with Gabriel. Jewish History Soundbites, and uh, this episode has been dedicated by a loyal listener who really wants Jewish History Soundbites to go back on air on a consistent basis. And on that note, I want to apologize for how long has it been? This hiatus? Uh, two months? Three months? I lost count already. I also have no idea why it took so long to get back on. Just one thing led to another over the summer and the yumpt of season. But it's been a few months since the last episodes have come out. I think it was on Siget, so it's quite some time ago. And I want to make a, a couple of announcements. First, a major announcement regarding the fact that Jewish History Soundbites, the podcast, is back. Uh, we're back. The return of the podcast for the winter season and beyond. It's going to be better than ever, and you don't want to miss it any at all, no matter what you've been listening to the last few months. Um, it's going to be great. There's, we're going to have series. In other words, we're going to have a you know, bunch of podcasts in a row, which will form a series on, a specific, on specific topics. There's going to be great episodes. It's going to come out on a consistent basis. And um, I will do my best to have the best content ever on a consistent basis, some great topics, some great series, and we're back in town. So I'm looking forward to having you around and to being back. If you want to help support Jewish History Soundbites, then the best way to do so is to tell your friends and family about it. You can also leave a rating and review on whatever platform you listen to the podcast. Of course, I want to make a very important mention. This is a dark day, a tragic day um, in Israel, challenging times. Um, unfortunately, many, many uh, dead, um, injured. Our hearts and our prayers are with the wounded, the captured, um, the Israeli soldiers who are out there on the front, and all Jews around this country who are currently in danger, and we hope that this ends quickly and safely with a minimal loss of life. This is definitely the most dangerous moment in Israel's history, uh, pr probably even greater than the Yom Kippur War. This is a scary time, and our hearts and our prayers are with all, like I said. Um, I thought, uh, besides for the important announcement that Jewish History Soundbites is back and apologizing for the last few months that I have not been able to get around to doing any episodes. So now we'll just discuss briefly, it's the art site of the Ribnitzer Rebbe, Reb Chaim Zanvil Abramovich, and he's recently become very popular. His cover in Muncie has become a site of pilgrimage. Um, thousands and thousands, everyone's going to Davin at his cover. And there's stories that come out and Baal Moifus and all kinds of miracles and, and miraculous events and all kinds of things are happening or some of them happened, some of them didn't happen, some of them will happen, some of them might happen. It makes no difference. What the point is, he was a very, very holy person and there's a lot to say about him and he lived at a very unique time in history as well. In fact, um, his, there's a book, I think, that recently came out about it. I don't think I got a chance to read it, but that's 
Um, you know, I guess I'll have to get around to that as well. But um, I saw I saw it advertised. A a obviously, you know, clarify the goals on this podcast is as we usually do. It's not going to be about the miracle stories that there's an abundance of, and I'm sure you can ask your neighbor or friend to tell you some stories about miracles with the Ribnitzer or davening by the Ribnitzer's cover, and he'll be more than happy to tell you, but I will try to give more of the backdrop, some of his history, his own biography, and some context. First of all, I grew up in Muncie when I was a child, before we moved to Israel, and he's buried in Muncie in 1995 when he passed away. He was buried in the Vizhnitzer Cemetery in Muncie. Also, when I was growing up, I was a fan of MBD, Mordechai Ben David. And I remember when the album Einoid Milvadi uh, was distributed. In those days, it was still cassette tapes, or maybe it was already CDs, I don't remember. And, of course, on that album, which, which was shortly after the Ribnitzer Rebbe's passing, and, of course, MBD was a very, very close uh, chassid and close follower with the Ribnitzer Rebbe. So on that, um, on that album was his famous song, Oi Rebbe, which was a, a ode, a, a tribute um, to the Ribnitzer Rebbe, to Rebbe Chaim Zanvil Abramovitz. So I was aware of him, obviously, from those two things. He was, his cover was in, you know, nearby, and 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 it was an MBD song. Um, but I didn't know much about him um, growing up. I'll be honest. Um, also, recently, last few years, I do tours in Harazesim in Israel. I actually had a very be- busy season over Sukkot. Not only Harazesim, but all my walking tours here in Israel. It's another reason why I didn't get around to the podcast. Thank God there's been many, many tours here. So next time you're in Israel, and hopefully there will be peace and 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 all the terrible things happening now will end soon, and we'll be able to uh, to have those tours again. So be in touch with me about that. But in any event, when I do Harazesim tours, so we pass right by the Ribnitzer Rebbe's first wife. His first wife is buried in Harazesim. So I always tell the groups that we have to market her kever also as some sort of zgula because her husband's kever seems to be doing pretty well. We got to pump up the uh, his wife's uh, kever and make some, you know, market something around it and you know, I hope to be involved in in making the money off of it when it do, when it does take off and is successful. But um if we want to delve into the actual story of Reb Chaim Zanvil Abramovitz, the Ribnitzer Rebbe. So we want to get into his background in of Romanian Jewry in the early 20th century, especially within the Hasidic movement. Romanian Jewry, there's different areas of what's today Romania. Uh, Bukovina, Bessarabia, Bessarabia, today there's another country there that was at times considered somewhat part of Romania, somewhat part of Russia. Today it's a different country called Moldova. Uh, a lot of areas which crossed borders, which were at times part of Russia, part of Austria, part of Romania, um, and and in that you know gray area where geography makes a big difference, um, but um, it gets very confusing about what time was which. So Romanian Jewry in the early 20th century is very much a combination of both Russian Jews who had migrated south, depend, again, dependent on which area of Romania, obviously. Um, it depended if it was Bukovina, which was more Austrian Empire, and Bessarabia, which was more the Russian Empire, or if it was Old Romania, which was further south. In any event, with the Hasidim who may, moved to Romania were primarily from the branches of the Rizhen Sadiger dynasty. Uh, the biggest ones in Romania were Bohush and Stefanest, also Pashkan, and a couple of other smaller ones. But there are other ones in Romania too. Vizhnitz is somewhat Romanian as well. There's a few other smaller Hasidic dynasties that ended up in Romania too. The question is, again, like I said, what are the borders? Because Satmar and Siget are technically in Romania too today, and at times before the war they were as well. So are they Romanian Hasidic dynasties, or are they Hungarian as they consider themselves? So... Um, it gets confusing. What makes it even more confusing is that the further south you go into the old Romania, not Bessarabia, Bukovina, or Moldova, if you consider that part of Romania too, it was really more part of Russia, the Tsarist Russian Empire. But if you go into old Romania, the Bucharest area, in the center and south of the country, 
So then that was actually part of the Ottoman Empire for many, many years before Romania gained its independence. Um, and therefore there was a strong Sephardic community. So it was very, very diverse, the Romanian Jewish community of the 19th and 20th centuries. And like I said, it confuses it because of all the different borders. The Soviet Union eventually encompassed some parts of Romania. On the other hand, Romania was a communist country post-World War II, but it was not officially incorporated into the Soviet Union. So again, it gets confusing, because you could talk about communist Romania, and are you talking about the parts of Romania that were actually in the Soviet Union, or are you talking about the country of Romania that was, that was communist, um, which had its own awful dictator, his, uh, um, oh, I forgot his name, Khrushchev, whatever it was, the one who was shot in uh, 1989, 1990, something like that. Um, eh, but um, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Khrushchev, sorry, I forget his name, either way, it doesn't matter. Um, I should have looked it up and had it in my notes. But um, um, so, the, so the, the, there's communist Romania, but that's the Romania or the areas of Romania that the Ribnitz Rebbe is born into. He's born into a simple family in Bukovina in either the 1890s or 1902. There's about three or four different versions of what the year of his birth was. And it makes it very interesting because he passed away in Muncie in 1995. So he lived a very long, fruitful life across many eras. If he was born in the early 1890s, as some claim, then he was like 103 when he passed away. If he was born in the late 1890s, as others claim, then he was, um, you know, 97, 98. If he was born in 1902, then he was 93. Um, so either way, he lived a very, very long and fruitful life. Um, as a teenager, he received smicha from the foremost rabbinical leader in Moldova at the time, Rabbi Hudalay Tzirilson, who was a fascinating individual and also deserves his own episode. He was a very, very famous rabbi and leader and writer in Romania and Eastern Europe in general. Before World War One, it was actually part of Russia. He was the rabbi of Kishinev for many years, which is the capital of Moldova. Um, and he, 1908, I think, and on, he was the rav in in uh, Kishinev. He was a founder and leader of Agudis Yisrael, though he was more Zionistic. So he was like the left flank, the Zionistic flank of Agudis Yisrael. Um, and he was killed in the first days of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in, in the summer of 1941. As far as I understood, it was from the invasion of of the Soviet Union itself, not in the context of the Holocaust. In other words, it was like during a bombing raid or something like that. But um, he was one of the elder statesmen of rabbinical Jewish Europe and in and of Agudis Yisrael, fascinating individual. So um, he served in the Romanian parliament, actually, from 1920 to 1926. He taught himself Romanian, even though before that it had been Russia. Um, so this, so the, um, the Ribnitz Rebbe gets uh, smicha, his rabbinical ordination from Rabbi Yehuda Leib Tzirilson. And he was also a chassid. He was a close follower of the Shtefaneshta Rebbe. Now, the Shtefaneshta dynasty was a branch of Rizhin, a very, very prominent, large dynasty, mostly forgotten today. And the Shtefaneshta Rebbe was Rabbi Avraham Matasio Friedman, a grandson of the Rizhiner. In fact, he was born when the Rizhiner, his grandfather, was still alive. And he was named Avram Atasio Avram for Avram Amalach, who was, of course, the Rizhiner's grandfather, the Magad of Mizrich's son. And Matasio was because his grandfather, the Rizhiner, said he's like the Matasio of Hanukkah. He sees something in his neshama. And um, the, the, um, the Shtefan Eshter's father, Benachem Nachem, the Rizhiner's son, uh, passed away relatively young. So Avram Atasio Friedman, the second Shtefan Eshter Rebbe, was a Rebbe for 65 years, one of the longest Hasidic Rebbe tenures in history. Um, and he passed away childless in 1933. He's one of the greatest leaders of Romanian Jewry, especially in the Hasidic community. And he passed away childless in 1933. And in fact, he, he wanted Stefan to continue. He had a nephew, a really fascinating character, named Rebbe Nachem Nochem Friedman of Itzkan, who was a son-in-law of the Chartkova Rebbe, and he was supposed, he was named as the successor of his uncle, 
um, but he passed away, unfortunately, in his 50s, a month prior to his elderly uncle. So Stefanesh kind of came to an end in 1933 when the Stefanesher passed away. Um, most of the Romanian Hasidim went to uh, uh, Pashkan, others, other branches of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, excuse me, of Rizhen that were, that were around Romania. Um, the Stefanester, this Rabbi Rama Tzio Friedman, was reburied in the Nachlat Yitzchak Cemetery in Tel Aviv, really give a time, in 1969. Um, so there technically was no more Stefanesh, but his reburial here created big waves in, in Israel, and therefore he has a big legacy. Um, he His yard site is a major yard site in Israel with all kinds of zgulas and thousands of visitors, lots of food, I remember, the one time that I went. Um, and uh, it's a big it's a big thing here. I think it's the end of the summer. It's like, it's in the summer, so it's, you know, it's a big time for people to go. Interesting about Stefanesh and about Romanian Hasidus in general, especially the Rizhiner branches, is, is that they were much more open to Zionism than were most mainstream Hasidim. And Stefanesh, you could actually say that they were outright Zionists, um, which is fascinating. This um, Ramatasio Friedman, the headquarters of the Karen Hayasod and uh, fundraising, was in his Chatzar, in the Hasidic court itself. He he didn't identify with the Goddess Yisrael, um, it was, in fact, this designated successor of his, who was a, a very interesting character uh, for another time, uh, uh, like a, you know, shtickle maskils of some sorts. So this Rebbe Nachum Friedman of Itzkan was um, in his office, in his uncle's court. He had a picture of Herzl in the background. <laughs> um, so he, the Ribnitzer was a close follower of, of, of Stefanescht, of the Stefanescht Rebbe. I don't know anything about the Rebbe Rebbe's stance on Zionism. I don't know if he was a Zionist or not, but he was a close follower of the Stefanesh Rebbe, who was very closely identified with Zionism. What's interesting is that, as far as I know, the Satmar Hasidim flocked to the Ribnitzer's kever as a skula and the kever and the whole situation. I don't know if the Satmar Hasidim who go there are aware of this uh, Zionist connection through Stefanesh. Maybe they are. Um, maybe this gula is worth it. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. Either way, the Ribnitzer Rebbe emerges as a young rabbi in, excuse me, in pre-war um, Moldova, Bessarabia, and uh, he survives the Holocaust in Transnistria, which is the Romanian Holocaust, and then stays there in the Soviet Union. He survived the Holocaust somehow in in, in Romania, and then he made the conscious choice of remaining in. Communist Romania, when most rabbis and religious leaders uh, left, he's there. He stays. It's an incredible story, just the fact that he stayed. And then what he goes ahead and does when he stays, he becomes this jack-of-all-trades, servicing the Jewish community in every possible capacity uh, to, to keep Yiddishkeit alive. It's, it's absolutely an incredible story. That's the main primary story of the Ribnitzer. He's the Shaykhet, he's the Mael, he's He's the inspiration, he's the leader. He himself is going to the mikveh, the Dneister River. Even when it's freezing, even when it's frozen, he, 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 he's, uh, he travels around to different communities to inspire others, to be a leader of others around Moldova, Transnistria. Transnistria, during the war, during the war was the place where the Romanian Holocaust was perpetrated, primarily by Romanians, by the way. Also Nazis, but primarily by Romanians, which is another story. The Romanian Holocaust, an awful story. Um, see, he's there in that area of Transnistria, even afterwards in the Soviet Union, in the or, or communist Romania, whatever the borders are exactly at that time, and he becomes known um, throughout as leading davening, uh, having you know, le- having organized minyanim and, and going to the mikveh and 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 like this, he's this holy individual who somehow. Uh, does not get arrested and is able to continue. It's almost like miraculous what he's able to do to keep the flame of Judaism alive, of Hasidus, of of Yiddishkeit alive during this terrible time when the communist era, which is stamping out all religious activity. What's so interesting is that to me, I'm curious what what their personal relationship was. Uh, there's a, a lot of similarities 
um, with between the Rebbe's biography and the Skalena Rebbe's biography, Rebbe Lezer Zushia, Portugal, who was also a student of the Rijin dynasty, though in his case it was of the Bahush and Sadiger branches. Um, he was also from Moldova, Romania, Bessarabia, Bukovina area, also survived the Holocaust, also remained in the Soviet Union and inspired Jews and led them with incredible dedication during the communist era in Romania. And he also emerged as a great Hasidic leader at the time. Um, he, the Skeletor Rebbe made it out a drop earlier than the Rebbe Nitzir. He made it out in 1959. The Rebbe Nitzir Rebbe only made it out in 1970. There was a worldwide campaign to get the Skeletor Rebbe out, and he made it to the United States. But I find it incredible that there's this remarkable similarity between the two biographies of these great people. Skelen probably deserves its own episode, though, as does, by the way, the whole Stefanescht. Uh, dynasty in R- Romanian Hasidus. Either way, like I, getting back to Reb Chaim Zanvul Abramovitz, the Ribnitz Rebbe, he's this Rebbe under the communists. It's in the post-war era that he becomes something of a Hasidic Rebbe. He's not operating a Hasidic court or institutions in the conventional understanding of how that is functions. He leads the davening, a unique davening, by the way, long and intense, like his Rebbe of Stefanescht, Davin's very, very late in the day. It's, it's part of his whole his whole service. Uh, it's all under the eyes of the communist officials. Uh, seemingly, they just like look the other way. Um, he's known for the way he mourns the destruction of the Mesa Mikdash, wearing sackcloth, fasting very often, uh, observing Tikkun Chatzayis in a very unique fashion. He finally, after all these years... He's able to leave communist Eastern Europe in 1970s. He's one of the last of these great leaders to leave. He settles initially in Israel um, before moving to the United States with his, by then, his second wife. His first wife passed away, and that's what I mentioned before. She's buried in Harazesim. His second wife was nearly a half a century his junior, married together for the last, I think, 15 or so years of his life. Um, unfortunately, never had any children, though, which is why it's part of the Zgula for Having children is to daven by his graveside in Muncie. Now, getting back to a an episode I discussed several months ago about mashpiim in the history of the Hasidic movement, influencers. There's a Rebbe and there's a mashpia. How do we classify the Ribnitzer Rebbe? Was he a Rebbe or a mashpia? He didn't come from a Hasidic dynasty. He didn't have any Hasidic institutions. In many ways, he was a mashpia, and it's a throwback to the Baal Shem Tov style of Hasidus and a very very close, intimate relationship that he has with people, especially if we go back to the time that he was actually in the Soviet Union, which is the greatest story of his whole long life. Um, so that, that, that's the way I see it. It's very interesting historically how we view someone like the Ribnitz Rebbe as someone unique in his time, and, and because he didn't have any children, so he'll always remain a one-time uh, effect of, of what he was. In Israel, he initially settles in the Babov community in Bat Yam, later in Bnei Brak, Yerushalayim. He did not achieve much fame in Israel, interestingly enough. It was only in the United States in his later years when he first settles in Los Angeles, Miami, places that you wouldn't expect a Hasidic rabbi to settle. Then in Seagate, okay, that's Brooklyn already. It's already where MBD comes into the picture. And then in his last years in Muncie, and he was much more famous in his last years. People saw him as this Zkanhad Mayram, this elderly tzaddik who was who made you know miracles. People came to him for blessing and his advice, and he was you know he had been under the communists and he had survived everything. He was seen as someone from almost otherworldly, um, and he though he was never a rebbe in a conven- conventional sense. I think his legacy is quite powerful for what he did for others under the communists, for the followers he accrued there and in the United States in his later years and for the miracles attributed to him in his lifetime and beyond. So, like I said, Jewish History Soundbites is back. There's going to be good content coming, good series coming. Stay posted. This um, was Yehuda Gabra with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGabra.com. For questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures, you can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on your favorite podcast platform. And I hope you enjoyed.